life is rough. You gotta take the time to focus on what brings you joy. As the Japanese say, ikigai. Or, what am I nerding out about right now? <laughs> Join us at the gaming table. Or reading nook. To find your happiness. I'm Lainey. I'm Marshall. And this is Elated Geek. Hey guys, uh, this is Corey. This is Marshall. And welcome to Spinner Rack Kids. It's been a little bit. It's been a little bit, you know, space and time. It takes time sometimes. And guess what? Space to be time. I'm in space! Yeah, we're in time as well. So, podcasts are a learning experience. I've had a, uh, one before. This is my second full time podcast. And this one is a learning curve for sure i will not be trying to do the compendium encyclopedia <laughs> of comics for the next episode it's kind of what i did i kind of threw the kitchen sink at marshall and marshall is voracious he actually has another podcast on this network podcast talking about books so he's he's reading all the time he's got contests online that he's being forced to like jam fiction into his head I also play Tetris with myself. Yes, he does. But for me, I kind of hosed myself a little bit this this time because I gave so much stuff to read and I found out I'm kind of a slow reader and I'm going to have to find better ways, maybe trim down, find better ways of doing this. But anyways, the subject this week is Let There Be Space. We're just taking genre takes on the comics we like to read and so... We're going to start with uh, Star Trek. Now, we both grew up on Star Trek. I had certain issues with Star Trek. My brother liked TOS. It was too campy for me. I don't know how at that young age, you know, in the single digits, I understood what cheese was. That's, <laughs> it took that to make me understand because there's other things late that I watched at the time that were definitely cheesy. But the camp thing never really took hold in me, so I couldn't do that. But Star Trek uh, The Next Generation was my entree into that universe. And then when J.J. Uh, Abrams took hold, I enjoyed those as well. Go ahead and tell your, your Star Trek story. I grew up on Next Generation. I have memories of 7 o'clock at night. Every week uh, we would be eating dinner, watching Next Generation, and then afterwards I'd be playing with my blocks and marbles. And my mother has a com had a complete collection on VHS of the original series, including the missing pilot. Yeah, his mom's the Trekkie in the family, not the dad, which is in my generation of nerds. At least the female nerds weren't as vocal. Maybe they got shut down too much by the douchebag male nerds. But I, I didn't know that a female nerd existed as hardcore, really, until probably I met his mom to know that she was the Trekkie. I decided since Star Trek was such a big deal, we are watching Discovery and Picard as well. I thought, let's do some Star Trek comics. So there probably will be an, a future podcast where we go over even more space stuff. So we'll deal with uh, some more Star Trek stuff. Hopefully get some deeper stuff as well. What we what we went over here was, it's called Star Trek Academy. Is that correct? Does that make there was Star Trek Starfleet Academy Starfleet by Mike Academy. Johnson. It's actually got two different storylines. It's interesting how they're like set like two years apart. They're very close. Two different years of, of the Academy. One with the cast that you know from the J.J. Abrams movies. And one of the original cast in the comic. And so it's two different storylines but linked together with the distress signal. Yes. And it's really fun. For me, like I, I just said before we started, if you don't go deep in comics, at least make it fun. And that's what this is. It's, it's straight up fun. It's Star Trek light. Really, it's not like a Deep Space Nine, from what you said, went very deep philosophically. Very deep. This is just just straight up fun. Um, it's about it's an investigation. It's a little bit of a detective thing where Uhura is dealing with this distress signal. The other timeline is more it, of a it's, competition. Yeah, it's uh, somebody who is Vulcan who is going into this competition, being forced into a competition when she wants to leave Starfleet Academy. Now, what I do like about this book, it gave you a lot of the feeling of these books that I read. They were young adult Star Trek books that were set in Starfleet Academy and like the origin stories of all the main characters of Next Generation. It felt very much like that. Um, I wasn't like really 
into this comic, but it wasn't bad at all. For me, that's the thing. Like, when I say, if you can't make it deep, make it fun, is don't impede the read. That's a good... That's yeah, a good don't thing. impede the read. Don't throw a bunch of CSI, like, don't overindulge your characters with, like, dialogue that doesn't really sound like people talking. If you're not going to do that, just make simple character choices, like... All the characters sounded enough like the Star Trek characters that you saw in the Abrams movies. The investigation was primarily action. It didn't delve into any Trekno babble. It didn't really get in any specifics. It was just go, go, go. And that's not bad. We also read Star Trek Green Lantern crossovers. How do you feel about this kind of a crossover? You... I, I have read it, but honestly, like, that was one of the ones I didn't get to before this podcast. So you tell me, you didn't really like it that much. I remember yeah. thinking it was okay enough. So there, there's two separate ones. There's Star Trek Green Lantern, The Spectrum War, which takes place in the Kelvin timeline, which the, is the J.J. Abrams movies. And the Green Lantern portion of it takes place after Blackest Night, Brightest Day. And the... The characters are shunted into the Star Trek universe by something that they make up. And then all of these different lanterns are fighting each other. You have you know, all the different colors of the lanterns, not just green lanterns. And they're all just fighting each other because they like to fight. Starfleet gets involved and works with the, the good lanterns to do that. In Stranger Worlds... Necron and the Black Lantern show up. So now you have all of Vulcan turning into Black Lanterns, which is kind of interesting, but also a little unnecessary. And then they kind of left off and you're like, so where do we go from here? Like, what's 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 the end point here? Yeah, that's the thing about comics. And I was kind of getting into it with Marshall about this before we started the podcast, as we were just kind of discussing it is you have to hold comics loosely because... Mm -hmm. They sometimes end, sometimes shunt off into a different thing that's going to be written by different people. So if you're enjoying something, don't expect that you're going to get a neatly wrapped up ending. You just kind of go with it as you go. Since we're talking on this, I actually want to switch the order. Let's go ahead and talk about the Green Lantern apes. Oh, yeah. So uh, Planet thing. of the Apes versus the Green Lanterns. This was I actually kind of liked this. Yeah, one. it's really good. I really like the art. The what really sold me is when I found out like, oh, that's interesting. I wasn't really versed in the apes movies as a kid. Again, there's that whole kind of sci-fi. If I thought it might be campy, I w didn't want to get into it. It was one of those things. Saturday afternoons would be on and I'm uh, on TV, and I'd be like, I don't know about this. But I actually am now going through it. It's all on. They're all on HBO Max right now. All the Apes movies. Um, I mean, I'm talking about the 60s ones, not the yeah, they are a separate Tim Burton one or the even newer ones. Yeah, they are a separate continuity-ish. Yeah. And I think this one, this one goes with that 60s continuity, but it gives you a real feel of those characters in that world that I was like, huh, this actually makes it somewhat interesting. Yeah, they did a really good job. And what sold me on it is there's this great cover where... The main ape villain is just like his head is taking up the entire <laughs> thing. It's And the cool thing I like about it is they didn't just go, okay, here's our pat villains. Let's just have those guys be the villains in this story. No, they actually took Cornelius, which is one of the human-friendly apes in the ape stories. He actually helps the human character of Taylor, and he goes bad. And so the basic construct of the story is... It's like Lord of the Rings. There's a one ring to rule them all. This one the ring can mimic all the different emotional spectrums, but it is driven by the desire to replicate itself. Yeah. And so at times you'll see, if, you, if you're not familiar with the emotional spectrum of Green Lanterns, is every, all the different rings and the different ring bearers represent different emotions. So you'll see Cornelius... Uh, when he sees the woman he loves, he actually turns to the color of love. It's violet. Like violet, that's the one. Yeah, and so, it, and then when he's angry, so it's kind of really cool, this visual thing to see one character, like, 
switch for their emotions. I really enjoyed it. It was again, it was it's a straight fun series, little mini series. I'm actually not loving this series watching uh, it on HBO Max, but it's still very interesting. I kind of just got on a 60s sci-fi curiosity thread I'm following. So I've I've seen the the first two now in that series and uh yeah, it's an interesting thing because if you think all all science fiction is relative to, you know, it's time, it's talking about what's going on uh, in society and so there's a lot to be taken from those earlier titles i i, I did definitely enjoy them i also read another green lantern comic called hal jordan and the green lantern core this was not intended to be deep it was supposed to be fun this was like action 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 basically the the quick synopsis of the plot line is that the green lanterns all vanished as did their planet of oa everything is gone the only one that was left was hal jordan because he had gone rogue and was no longer wearing his ring so the sinestro corps the guys who do fear and they're based on yellow they took over the green lantern's place as the enforcers of order in the universe and that's not good yeah, this is part of the rebirth, uh, DC's yes. big rebirth thing, which I do like from all, I I don't read everything that DC does, but from what I've seen of what they do is they found a better way to handle events where the events kind of like, they are not retcons as much, they kind of like, maybe they create their own universes, I don't know, but it doesn't seem to be like every year we have to reboot everything, and so some interesting things they basically will do an event and it's kind of its own separate thing and if it takes off it they'll they'll keep doing it if people like it so which is nice i mean considering it makes sense that they're making stuff based on what the fans like yeah so i definitely enjoyed this one there was two books at the time hal jordan and the green lanterns and then just the green lanterns were the uh, green lantern title where they introduced some new lanterns and i i of the two i really enjoyed the the Hal Jordan uh, and the Green Lanterns run that it's really good and it's a long run it goes longer than even you read so yeah it, it's definitely an enjoyable that's I would say out of all sci-fi because to be particular that's why I call this let there be space because you can't lump Star Wars into that I think Green Lantern is actually my favorite sci-fi fandom Star Trek being a close second so so let's get into the other <sighs> thing that actually made me change the title of this episode uh star wars so i had marshall read the jason aaron run that came pre force awakens it was like them gearing up for force awakens but it has nothing to do with force awakens skywalker it's, strikes yeah skywalker mm -hmm. strikes so it's it's um him writing just post is it post new hope yes it's, it's right after episode four and it's like this is a series that bridges the gap between that and Empire Strikes Back and it takes time to delve into those characters. And we didn't really get into Star Trek versus Star Wars, but this is really where I feel it is. I have always been in love with the characters of Star Trek, but its universe is flat to me. In Star Wars, however, it's the opposite. The universe is so big and there's so much lore and there's so much history that's just like saturating it but the characters feel like tropes for the most part this when we start getting into these comics that we're talking about it fleshes them out makes them more well-rounded and that was one of the reasons why i really enjoyed solo um mm -hmm. i know a lot of people didn't but I liked fleshing out Han's character a little bit more, right. giving him more story. So Jason Aaron, he we talked about previously in the Southern Bastards. He wrote that uh -huh. book. I've heard interviews with Jason, and they said this is like him being able to literally take out some Star Wars figures and just play with them, and like <laughs> let it literally uh, to the level of what people sometimes criticize as fanfic. I mean, he but he does it so well. The characters all sound, if you close your oh, eyes, yeah. just, and if you could hear them, them, it just sounds like Han. It sounds like Luke. It sounds like Leia. He writes them so well and finds really fun ac 
action things to do. Now, the thing that strikes me, and I think I didn't think about it maybe till I watched Clone Wars or Rebels or something like that. Like, the thing that's fun about Star Wars that you don't have with Star Trek is it's spycraft. Yes. It's all espionage. Maybe I just maybe I thought about that when I saw Rogue One or something like that. But the more it was more reinforced is that it's all spycraft. Like what Leia does, she's basically the female James Bond. That's what it, all the all these little missions are doing mm-hmm. because yes, they're in the big battles, but it's also interesting to see this little like espionage, sabotage stuff they do. Whereas Star Trek ends up being much more naval. Yeah, in, in, in its focus, it's, a sta- it's the more the establishment than it is. Oh yeah, the- and that's actually one of the things that I've had a problem with Star Trek with as time went on. In order to give them stakes, they have to constantly invent bigger and badder enemies, and it just doesn't work. Yeah, they really need to do. Um, I wish it's not that I didn't enjoy Discovery. Picard, I enjoyed a little less than Discovery. But I think they just need to do a Maquis series. They really oh, do. Because yeah. the Maquis is the actual Starfleet people that rebel against. And they're doing their own uh, sabotage and stuff like that. That would be an interesting thing. They need to like not be so precious with their characters. They need to blow stuff up, I think, a little bit. That would yeah. be more interesting. When they launched the new wave of comics this is just to give a little business side of it star wars comics were originally marvel comics back Mm -hmm. in the day when the when the movies first came out so it was kind of cool i know people get all up in arms about corporate stuff i'm not a big fan of some corporate stuff but for me to have the marvel get the star wars rights back i think it's really cool there's been no end of star wars comics so feel free to investigate all those there's a ton of ones that are constantly running. They're constantly coming out with new ones. There's little ones that bridge gaps to the, the new movies that come out. I actually haven't looked in a while, but there's probably stuff that's coming out on Mandalorian and all that stuff as well. But the one that I really enjoyed, I tend to be kind of ADD and get bored easily. So to a new character that was introduced in comics, stuff like that I love. The way Harley... Quinn was introduced yeah. in Batman. You just uh, these define the, the little hidden nuggets. And this one is Dr. Afra, introduced <sighs> in uh, Marvel Comics wave of Star Wars. An interesting character. Most of what we see in Star Wars is very black and white. Jedi, Sith, you know. But this character is a character that she definitely sits in the middle. She's working at times for Vader. She has... <laughs> What I call the shadow droids. They are the shadow of 3PO and R2. They are like murderous, like yeah. explosive. like One of them, Triple Zero, like, I think is really cool. He's one of the reasons why when you go to that cantina in episode four, they don't allow droids in the cantina. Because Triple Zero is, he looks like a typical protocol droid, but he's actually a spy droid. He's a walking Abu Ghraib is what he is. Exactly. Like, it's insane. Like, so imagine 3PO, but black. Basically, that's his, that's his color. And very mean. And then BT, similar to uh, R2 droid. He's a different. Astromech, yeah. Yeah, he's an astromech droid, but he's different shape and everything. But, but man, and he's just like arsenal. He's just an arsenal. He's got like every mm-hmm. weapon they'd ever need. So it's interesting to see Dr. Afra, basically with any media thing in general, for the most part, it's going to keep going if it's popular. They have, uh, they're on their second or third volume at this, at this point, maybe fourth volume because they it went away for a little while, but then they brought it back. Highly, highly recommend. Yes. It's, it's very, as much as I talk about the darkness in it, it's very funny. Her character is very sarcastic. Her character is constantly getting into trouble, very similar to Solo in that way. Yes, constantly, I got that same feeling. Yeah, constantly yeah. like trying to make her way through, and you know, kind of she's just trying to get money or whatever, just survive and maybe get enough to stop doing the bad stuff she does. Um, she's an archaeologist, and she's just con- constantly trying to get artifacts. And she's young, but she kind of you kind of get the sense like she wants to retire find a way to like just kind of get out of it uh, because it's, she's constantly at odds and constantly in danger. But yeah, just highly recommend it. Dr. Afra. It's so good. Did you ever now, afterwards, he also handed me this really fat, 
fact set of comics. It's the comic book adaptation of the Thrawn trilogy by much Timothy Zahn. Much beloved. Zahn. Much beloved. You the, books were, the books were much beloved. I remembered Thrawn from some of the young adult Star Wars books that I read when I was much younger. But this this had some really interesting story. Thrawn himself is really awesome. He mm-hmm. is perhaps one of the best Star Wars villains I've seen. And you can see him in Rebels if you mm-hmm. don't want to do the comic thing or the reading. He's thing. really good in Rebels. It's the exact same character. Unfortunately, with this one, the plot was very stunted because they had so many different characters in different places and they're all going they're constantly having to jump all over the place to the point that in the center portion of this like the second third i had no idea what was going on and there was no point to any of it i could have skipped that whole thing gone right to the third the last third and been like this was actually pretty good. Yeah, this is uh, during the Dark Horse era when yes. Marvel didn't have Star Wars. So in an adaptation, man, you got to streamline things, especially if you're doing comics. There's no, I mean, this is going to be my pet peeve. You're going to hear me. You know, it's going to become a drinking game on this show. It's a visual medium. If it's a visual medium, you don't need a ton of baggage. You don't need yeah, a ton you don't of need words. Dialogue. You don't, you know, you can do so much with your artist. And it sounds to me like on the second volume of this thing where the writer was trying to just be so precious with the written part of the story that he did not let the artist have their way and make streamline it and make it work. So I've also this is something that like for various birthdays and holidays, Corey has been supplying me with a steady stream of these, and I think I finally got my hands on the last one. Mm-hmm. But Daniel Wallace has been producing this series of books that you've probably heard of on the Elated Geek podcast that are in universe for Star Wars. So it's, there's the Jedi Way, the Book of Sith, the Imperial Handbook, Smuggler's Hand Guide, and the, yeah, as the Bounty Hunter's Handbook. And these are really interesting books. The They do a good job of even further fleshing out characters by having them react to these books. And so you, you're seeing this old Jedi text being the introduction to how to be a Jedi. And you have Yoda and Qui-Gon Jinn and Luke... They're all writing in the margins. Yeah, so it's th- these are graphic books. They're not novels. The, they're they're really encyclopedia in a way. They um, they are the, much more in universe information dumps. Yeah, and they're not big. It's not like people old like me know what an encyclopedia is. People that are too young just know Google. But generally, these kind of books would be super thick and super weighty. Like even if you go to Marvel Encyclopedia, there's so many characters; it's it's giant. These are super thin, digestible, fun, and they're they're graphic pages, so they're nice, like nice paper, like glossy paper pages and stuff like that. And they do all sorts of things with the actual texture of the paper and how it's cut to suggest different things. So the Book of Sith actually has three different cuts of pages. To really make it so that stuff. you can feel like they're separate books that have been bound together by Palpatine. And I really enjoyed those. So if you're interested in finding out more, like the Imperial Handbook actually explains why they use the AT-AT walkers and the ATST walkers as opposed to, oh, hover tanks. Interesting. Yes. Yeah, that's the thing is once I learned what he likes is like he likes the technical, he likes the lore. Once I learned that that's kind of his thing, anytime I find something that that is a book that's from a universe that we like or from a fandom that we like. I know that's just a given. Just get to it. Yeah. One of the earlier ones I got him was the Gravity Falls. Journal 3. Journal 3 like that. I mean, it, it, it's super easy to to please him that way because I know that's what he likes. Yeah. So. I love these in-universe books. They're great. So that kind of deals with Star Wars. Yeah. And so. we're not going to get into Stargate or Battlestar Galactica. Maybe I, next time, if you um, want. We got um, I'm not sure. Like, Battlestar Galactica is kind of hit or miss with me, but yeah. Stargate. Ooh. Well, who knows? The thing is, sometimes uh, comics are an opportunity for things. You actually expand and not have Hollywood, you know, crush stories. So there might be some actual good ones in those universes is what we could find. One that... Uh, a story that's much beloved in the, the Marvel fandom um, now 
<laughs> post <laughs> James Gunn, before James Gunn, everyone that read Marvel comics were like, you're going to make a movie out of what? Yeah. <laughs> it was literally Z list characters. So guardians of the galaxy. So I'm all, I think I'm always going to try a new guardians volume because yeah. it hits my sweet spot. It actually hits my star Wars sweet spot. It's that let's, get this motley group of people or just people of different things so you got a princess with a pirate with a farm boy with a, a yeah. big furry monster that kind of thing for whatever reason and the comedy of that the opportunities there if you got that going on i will read anything that's why i generally prefer team books to solo books so we read a couple of volumes of guardians why don't you yeah so we have guardians of the galaxy new guard volume one the final gauntlet and the a collection of ones from 2020 i don't think it's all of them from 2020 no no it's still going new guard is actually done by brian michael bendis who has taken over a lot of marvel comics but the other ones are by other people donny cates and al ewing al ewing i think is kind of taking a lot of lead in marvel these days yeah well bendis left bendis is with dc so he's been doing like superman and a lot of the younger books there uh, the wonder comics books and stuff so that's why bendis was a long-term marvel guy he he launched ultimate spider-man did a lot there he, there's a lot of indie books you can get his, his books powers and stuff like that but he's like one of the pillars of modern comics i'd say from like the 2000s on for sure like maybe late 90s 2000s he this guy you you hear a lot of talk about robert kirkman with walking dead bendis is like right there as a pillar of, of comics with him let's since i'm talking about him let's talk about his his run interesting the thing about guardians you got to understand uh, when you approach these books i try to be as like user friendly with you guys guardians is a catch-all yeah they're gonna throw tons of people at guardians it's kind of like x-men you if you've only like watched x-men movies and expect the cast that you saw they 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 rotate a lot they're so uh, yeah they what they call in uh, baseball a deep bench that they could pull from so in this one it's different you have quill is in the story peter quill is in the story but not the main part of the story so speaking of x-men you've got kitty pride shadow cat the girl that can run through walls you do have rocket you do have drax but you also have venom but and- in this case it's not the it's not eddie brock venom this is Flash Thompson from mm. Spider-Man, and he has taken over the Venom symbiote. And the part of the reason is because he was hit by something, I think it was an IED, and was paralyzed from the waist down. Right. And when he was given the Venom symbiote, the symbiote actually allows him to use his legs. But because Venom tries to take over its host, a lot of the symbiotes try to take over their hosts, they have figured out that there's a certain time limit of him using the symbiote. He's actually working for the U.S. military. So he's called Agent Venom. There you go. And so Flash Thompson, if you know, is the bully. Started out as the bully for Spider-Man in high school. And that's who this guy is. The other character in here, which I'm hoping and I'm pretty sure Marvel's going to nail Fantastic Four when they bring it around again. So this is the thing. Ben Mm -hmm. Grimm's, if you've ever seen a character with basically made out of orange rock, that's him. He's got a kind of a gruff but lovable character. He's much beloved in the Marvel community. He's kind of like Rocket in a lot of ways, kind of a comparable to that, where it's almost like this New York sensibility of a character. But he's kind of more like the uncle of the, yeah. of the crew. And then I believe the said Groot is in there as well. This one was a very interesting book. It's dealing very heavily with Star-Lord being one half of an because it's different than the movies he is one half spartax Mm -hmm. which is a different race they're very human-like but they're very militaristic Mm -hmm. very high tech so he's not this son of ego which drove me nuts guys like i'm never gonna not complain about guardians 2 mainly because i like kurt russell and I think he was miscast. Mm. I think James Gunn really wanted to work with Kurt Russell. But you put him in this thing where it's like he's a jerk. I mean, that works to certain levels. Like Tarantino did that really well with Death, Death Proof. Putting, the character in Death Proof worked because 
it was a Hollywood thing. He was a stuntman. So Kurt kind of grew up in Hollywood, so he understood that, and it fit. This one was making him this grandiose Shakespearean jerk of a planet. And it just, it, for me, it didn't, it didn't work. It didn't work with the actor. Uh, maybe they could have gotten a different actor to do it, but I, it's got a bad taste I in my I just generally found that that one to have issues generally with its scale and the feel of it. I just, I yeah, didn't we, the, get it. Bottom line is if we don't like it, we ain't buying it. Not, we're not completionists in that way. And my wife and I, we basically decided, no, nope, we're not getting that. And Let's, in the end, like there really isn't a huge amount of reason to buy no, into it. Was, that, that was the other thing. It wasn't connected. It didn't further the Marvel story. So it was like, Fair game, cut it off. Hopefully, with this the the third one, he pulls it back in. But getting to this one, so like we, yeah, he said the Spartax thing. Uh, Peter Quill's dad was the basically the king of Spartax or yes. whatever you call it, the ruler of Spartax. And in this one, he takes he it's kind of forced to take over when his dad leaves. Right, his dad doesn't die; he leaves. Yeah, his I think his dad left. And he does not really want the job, and he's not really good at the job. Imagine, let's let's not even get to ruler of a planet. Imagine Quill being mayor of a town. That much he can't even handle. He's not that responsible. That's why he does what he does. He's a thief. He can barely he's, manage a ship. Yeah, he can barely manage exactly being captain of a ship, as you see with uh, Thor taking over <laughs> in the movies. Um, yeah, so it's a... It's, uh, it's interesting to see him try to be the bureaucracy, the bureaucratic guy, and yeah, it's just not happening, not working. Now, uh, in this, uh, Kitty Pride and he are actually together, so they're like trying to manage a relationship while he's trying to manage a planet. Um, and she has actually taken over the Star Lord mantle while mm -hmm. he's gone, and we get this really awesome scene early on. Where she's actually playing up something she discovered about her powers that if she phases through alien tech, it blows it up. Yeah. So she just jumps out of the ship and goes after these other alien ships and just does ballet dancing, ice skating across them and through them and they all blow up and everybody's like... That is OP. But <laughs> yeah. at the same time, like, I had no idea about their relationship. I had no idea of anything. So when I first walked into this and I'm like, wait, when did Star-Lord become a chick? Oh, that's Kitty Pride. Yeah. Wow, she grew up good. Yeah. So She's it's really kill it's kicking. It's a lot of fun. The uh, thing that for me that kind of I got a kick out of is like Kitty Pride's Jewish. She was raised Jewish. And so she's got a lot of like oi and... All that kind of Yiddish stuff in it too, I, which I enjoyed a lot of. Um, it's, I mean, this is a straight up fun run. There's nothing like it's. It's well done. It uses a lot of the Marvel cosmic universe stuff, but also keeps it just. Um, and that's what I character. like about the lo a lot of the Guardians of the Galaxy. It's super fun, but it does deepen the breadth of the universe. Right. Yeah. And so that also then brings us into The Final Gauntlet by Donny Cates. This one is a lot more story based, but this one is where Thanos, quote unquote, has died again, but he has downloaded his brain into somebody. And we've got to figure out who it is, and we've got to stop them, because obviously they're going to do something bad. But this was a big investigation storyline that I really enjoyed. Yeah, this is one that starts out with the 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 reading of the will, which is fun. Uh, that whole thing, just that whole rogues gallery of characters as they're re reading Thanos' will. That but this also kind of splits up the group a lot. Mm -hmm. As the galaxy at large believes that Gamora has his, has Thanos' brain in her. And different people in the group think she is. Some people think that she isn't. And how they want to handle this situation causes them to just have a rift. And they all go different ways. And I kind of like that a little bit. Because they all see different parts of the universe. Yeah, I think so far... I can only remember of one volume of Guardians where I heard from a podcast to check it out and I didn't enjoy it. But most, for the most part, there's always something 
to enjoy about a Guardians book. We're going to move to another similar type of setup, in a, and it's uh, Firefly. Now, we got to start this off by doing a disclaimer about Joss Whedon. If any of you guys hear this and think that we shouldn't talk anything about Joss Whedon, fair enough. If you don't want to listen to this, if it's, we're big Joss Whedon people. To be specific, we really have enjoyed some of the series that he's created. We don't condone any of the actions that he has been purported to engage in and we are not going to really delve into any of that here but we are going to talk about firefly yes because that has been something we've always enjoyed a lot yes yeah, so the firefly comics that came before the recent boom acquisition boom is the name of a comic publisher that I've really enjoyed and Marshall's really enjoyed as well mm -hmm. were hit or miss especially with the art Whereas the now that Boom has acquired them, they have been really solid and really good, and I've been definitely enjoyed them as well. What did you think about this run of the ones that we read? Was Volume One and Two of the Unification War, as well as Serenity: The Shepherd's Tale. Shepherd's Tale is it, it's actually a kind of a prequel to the movie of Serenity. Yeah, but. It also somewhat happens during it. Uh, well, yeah, it's a flashback. It goes all the way back to his younger days. So it actually predates even this boom acquisition that I was talking yeah. about. But I, for diehard fans, everybody wants to know, like, even the cast on the show wanted to know what Shepard's past was, what he, because he seemed to know a lot about a lot of stuff, the, like the actual... Alliance. The Federate, yeah, the Alliance. There so he go. seems to know a lot about the Alliance, and they were definitely the the brown coats. So there was always this question, like, how do you know much so much? But obviously, fourteen episodes didn't give them time enough to go deep into it. So that's why I had Marshall read the the Shepherd's Tale. So what, if you're a uh, brown coat, if you're a diehard Firefly fan, definitely uh, look up the Shepherd's Tale. It's definitely worth getting into. Whereas the Unification War was a very different story, this one deals with Mal getting captured by some Alliance people, and it sparks this big, huge conflict with all the remnants of the uh, Rebellion, or whatever they'd call themselves, and they, they're all getting into this big fight, and it's really more of a question of are they fighting to save him or are they fighting because they just want to fight? And that's for both sides. It's kind of interesting. Yeah. Um, and then we actually, we, we hear about it right at the end, but it gets into why was Mal even a part of this rebellion and where it went from there what the story of the rebellion was in the first place. And I kind of liked that bit. Yeah, it's good. The nice thing about it is, like he said, we read the first two volumes. Boom is serious about Buffy and Firefly. So if you're still a fan of the these stories, check them out on Boom. Uh, there's much more arcs uh, that we didn't even get to. Definitely check those Although out. Although this does also bring up something that I just shared a TikTok with you that uh, somebody had kind of figured out there was a lot of similarities between Firefly and a really old anime Did called... Did you look at the date, like how old it was? Uh, oh, uh... Outlaw Star is pretty old. It it came out at around the same time as Cowboy Bebop, although I think it predates it a little bit. I think it was in the 80s, but like the late 80s. Outlaw Star is very similar to it. it you have this kind of rascally captain of a ship who finds a girl that is in a cryostasis suitcase who is what everybody in the galaxy wants to chase down and get their hands on because she's the key to what's actually making the universe tick okay so it predates firefly was 2002 it was 1998 so it predates it by four years. Yeah. So he, Joss Whedon could have definitely watched this. Oh, yeah. Because he's, he's that much of a nerd where he 
But one thing I am going to definitely say, and you can you can watch the two and you can definitely see all the similarities, but the biggest difference here is that Firefly's characters are so much deeper and their dialogue is written so much better than Outlaw Star. Outlaw Star is very much a shonen anime and it's not got a lot of depth to it. It's mostly Flash and style. Well, that's that's our time in that verse. Um <laughs> Let's... But but we do have a, another captain we need to talk about. Not Captain Mal. Yeah, a controversial captain, which I don't understand why. But a new favorite character for, for me, for sure. It's Captain Marvel. I... Mean, we're not talking about the Shazam DC Captain no, no, Marvel. No, 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 no. We're talking about... Captain Marvel from Marvel. In my vernacular, I just say Shazam. That's that's I, what I, I, like I think it. of him as, too. Yeah, yeah. And I don't think many, especially now that they called the movie Shazam, nobody's going to be calling him Captain Marvel. Uh, but no, Captain Marvel, uh, I had actually, I kind of just read random comics. I generally go from, I'll read a superhero book and then an indie book just so I don't let anything lapse in my reading so i'm constantly getting a good diversity of story and i literally happened to be reading captain marvel uh very similar to happened to be reading winter soldier that led right up to the movie coming out uh -huh. so so for each one of those i was actually randomly prepared for uh the movie and this uh run what's the name of the author uh kelly sue DeConnick. oh my goodness i'd never heard of her before but this. she's got these, and the the ones that he gave me to read was Higher, Further, Faster, More, Stay Fly, and Elise Velat Preprice. And that one means she flies with her own wings in mm. Latin. I, I like that. Just, I mean, like, I literally screen capped something from here just because I thought it was a good kind of statement for women. I say this statement for women, now you're thinking, oh, it's going to be this militarist. No, it's straight up as fun as Star Wars and Guardians that I've been saying. Mm -hmm. It's that fun of a book. It's a team. She's got a team. What they are doing is they are sending a delegate from Earth to be a part of the Guardians of the Galaxy on a rotating basis. So you are seeing, uh, when we were reading the Guardians of the Galaxy New Guard, they had the thing. They had Agent Venom, and then they had Kitty Pride. It's like doing your tour of duty, basically. Exactly. Yeah. And this is Captain Marvel's tour of duty. So she does actually have time where she's with Rocket and Groot. The thing I love about comics, and I try to get people to read comics as much as I can, because people have mixed results with movies and stuff like that, but if you knew how hard it is to make a movie... You would know why things kind of go awry. But in this one, where is her apartment? Oh, just in the crown of the Statue of Liberty. Because you can get somebody to draw that for very inexpensive. You can't get somebody to reproduce that digitally in a movie. It'd be more expensive. I just love that. And this is where you get her basic niece. The way they handle it in the movie, I do like. Where she's got this friend who has a kid. In this one, it's her sister that has a kid, so Lieutenant Trouble is actually her niece, as opposed to her adopted niece. But I do like that relationship. I thought that was very well written. Mm -hmm. um, While I, I really loved all of these stories, I, I just they were so fun. They, they just flew right by. My best, the one that I liked the best out of the group of them was Stay Fly. And this one deals very heavily with her kitty cat that is not a kitty cat yeah it, it, it is as you probably saw in the movies an alien creature that has its own dimension within its stomach it's a flurkin it's a flurkin and it it's also a very rare creature that then lays eggs in the ship that was fun I'm gonna have you. I'm gonna have him read some of the narration. Just read in the room oh, yeah. that narration stuff, just to show you how good even a fun comic can be written. Have you ever seen a little girl run so fast she falls down? There's an instant, a fraction of a second before the world catches hold of her again. A moment when she's outrun every doubt and every fear she's ever had about herself, and she flies. In that one moment, 
every little girl flies. I need to find that again. Like taking a car out into the desert to find out how fast it can go. I need to find the edge of me. Come on. Come on, son. Like, that's like that's that scene. When, I, when he's reading that, the scene I see is that scene from the movie where you see all the little girls get their skin knees or the the, the mm-hmm. sports thing and they're all standing up and standing up oh come on it's good stuff mm-hmm. so highly highly recommend this captain marvel it's uh the 2014 starts in 2014 to quote ferris bueller so choice i it doesn't get any better than that for me it's where you get wonder of space so y- you can have the fun and stuff but you can actually inject little personal moments like that that give you that wonder of space and that takes us through everything you had me read in a month. Yeah. So for those of you that were listening to the Elated Geek and I was saying, well, he had me read a bunch of comics. There you go. That was all of them. Yeah. That was a lot of pages. So for next time, it won't be as much. I'll make sure that. Yeah. Because that was a, that was a slog. That was a, uh, yeah, it was a tough go. But we got through it. We got back home. From being out in space, I definitely highly recommend most of these comics. I think the only ones that we didn't recommend was probably the Star Trek Green Lantern ones. But just a lot of fun. If it's stuff that if if you kind consider yourself a temporary interest into the the area of space, most of what we give you here will fill that need and that void uh, very well because it's pretty much just straight up fun stuff. So. Thank you for listening to Elated Geek. Follow us on social media for pictures and more info on things we talked about in today's podcast. You can find Laney on at Zany Laney or me at One True Hazard. You can also find at Elated Geek on our Instagram. And you can also find Elated Geek Tweets on Twitter. If you want to go to a website, we have www.elatedgeek.com. Links for these are in the show notes. If you want to help us to continue to bring you new and exciting things to nerd out about, please consider donating to our coffee account. The link is in the show notes and every donation is accepted with total appreciation for your support in us. Send us your geek obsessions or topics that you want us to experience and talk about in future episodes. Email us at share at elatedgeek.com. And until next time, geek out.